video I'll be headed to the Vintage Computer Festival which is near Chicago, and this year my wife wanted to drive her Chevrolet Bolt EUV. Now we've done a couple of road trips in it already, but this will be the longest one yet, and the goal here is to answer two questions. The first is, can you road trip in an EUV? And the second and more specific question is, can you road trip in a Bolt? And what's the difference you might ask? Well, the Bolt has a few things going against it for road trips, starting with the range. At 247 miles of range, it's considered entry level these days uh, compared to most other EVs, with some high-end models now going as far as 500 miles per charge. The second issue is the Bolt's charging rate, which is probably the slowest rate of all currently manufactured EVs, coming in at 55 kilowatts. Now, some vehicles are literally seven times as fast. Well, sort of. It's kind of complicated. The rating is a peak rating, and so even one of those ultra-fast charging cars will still slow down considerably by the time the battery is half full. A typical EV looks more like this, and the Bolt, unfortunately, looks like this. So, on our trip to VCF, we'll find out exactly how much of a hindrance this is, but I think it's safe to say if we can make the trip in a Bolt, then you can certainly make the trip in any other EV. My wife did most of the driving, and our first planned stop was Durant, Oklahoma. It was about a two-hour drive from our home near Fort Worth. Unfortunately, uh, this location uh, at Durant City Hall has uh, only a single fast charger, which is operated by Francis, and when we arrived, I thought a big van was blocking the location, only to realize it was actually an electric transit. I've never actually seen one of these before. Uh, fortunately, he was just finishing up as we arrived, so we moved over and plugged in. Uh, the car was estimating 45 minutes to reach our target of 80%. However, I found it often overestimates the time, but uh, since we're right in the middle of downtown Durant, uh, we took a little walk down the street uh, to see if we could find some lunch. Uh, we found a little place called Bee's Kitchen just right around the corner. And by the time we returned to the car, we were actually at 85%, which is more than we planned for, so um, we just unplugged and headed back out on the road. Another two hours later, uh, we were ready for our next stop in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Uh, this was another Francis Charger, and it was located across the street from a QT. There wasn't much to do here um, other than use the restroom and get a snack. Uh, we were here for about 15 minutes, and I wanted to explain our strategy. I mean, you might think we would hit every single charger along the way, but we really didn't need to, so we skipped over quite a few, but I always tried to make sure we had enough range to make it to the next nearest charger, just in case we encountered one that was broken. Our next stop was only an hour drive away in Vanita, which was at a Walmart. Uh, we were also here for about 20 minutes while we actually did a little shopping for some things we forgot to bring with us, like uh, toothpaste. <laughs> Soon we were back on the road and crossed over into Missouri. Our next stop, Joplin. We pulled into a truck stop called Big Apple Travel Center. They had two chargers and uh, we pulled right in next to another Bolt EUV, although a slightly different color. It was time for dinner at this point, and you might not think of a truck stop as having good food, but uh, my wife and I both agreed that these gigantic chicken tenders were the best we'd ever eaten. After eating, the car was charged and we were back on the road to our last fast charging stop of the day, Springfield. I guess this is the home of the Simpsons, right? We pulled into a come and go where they had two charge point fast chargers. Uh, we were there for about 15 minutes and then back on the road. After driving another two hours, we stopped in St. James and plugged into a level two charger. Now these are not fast chargers, these are for overnight, which is fine because this is the hotel we were staying at for the night. Uh, we were slightly over halfway to Chicago at this point. So the next morning we came out to the car and saw that it was charged all the way to 100%, uh, which means we can drive quite a ways before stopping again. So back on the road, and you can see the St. James water tower from there. We drove for another two hours through the middle of nowhere until we arrived in St. Louis. And while there were some charging stations here, we just passed right on through. Our next stop was uh, actually in Troy, Illinois at a Holiday Inn, which is a weird place to find a fast charger. And there wasn't much to do here, so uh, we had to wait around for about 15 minutes. And uh, I could admire all of the bug guts on our car. Our next stop was in Springfield, home of the Simpsons. So, wait a minute. Didn't we already stop there? <laughs> uh, we actually stopped to charge in two different cities named Springfield, uh, one in Missouri and the other one in Illinois. 
This one was located at a Walmart, and uh, in the same parking lot there was a place called Pizza Ranch. So uh, we ate lunch there while the car was charging. It was uh, buffet style pizza, and it actually wasn't bad. Uh, they had chicken too. So back on the road, our final fast charge stop would be in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, this was also located at a Walmart where we charged next to a Polestar. After 20 minutes or so, we were back on the road, and we had another two hours to drive. But we were done with fast chargers. Our next stop would be the hotel itself, where VCF actually takes place. And um, here we are, just a couple of miles from the hotel. Uh, we knew the hotel itself had charging, but all they had were two Tesla destination chargers. Fortunately, we have a solution for that. It's a Tesla adapter, which worked out great. We were able to get a full charge here. Uh, we'd be at this hotel for the next three days. And uh, that wraps up the final leg of our two day journey. Okay, so it's time for a reality check. I definitely proved, yes, you can do a road trip in a bolt. But the question is, uh, how much more convenient would it have been had we had a more capable electric car? Um, I think one of the faster charging and longer range cars would have probably cut at least an hour off of each day of travel. So that would have saved two hours total. But uh, what about a gas car? So last year, I actually drove a gas car on the exact same route. So I think I have a pretty good point of comparison. First of all, it did take a lot of planning to determine which route I wanted to take. I spent some time reading reviews on PlugShare and making sure I knew which chargers were reliable and which weren't. And I wouldn't have needed to do that for a gas car. And second of all, uh, we wouldn't have needed to stop as often or for as long. Overall, I think we could have saved about two hours each day driving the gas car for a total of four hours saved on the whole trip. Now keep in mind, even in the gas car, it was still gonna be a two day trip. You know, that being said, um, we actually found ourselves looking forward to the stops. Uh, you know, after you've driven for a couple of hours, it's kind of nice to get out and uh, go to the bathroom, you know, get a snack or something to eat and, uh, you know, walk around, stretch your legs a little bit. And uh, we rarely ever found ourselves actually waiting on the car to charge. I think there were only a couple of times where we actually had to wait on it. In the vast majority of cases, uh, the car was done before we were. So enough about the trip. Let's talk about VCF. Vintage Computer Festival is one of the biggest gatherings of computer nerds. Uh, this is the area where my booth was located, but uh, this view represents about a third of the overall floor space. Now, when I go to these events, uh, I get to talk to fans and sell some merchandise and show off some of my equipment. Uh, this year, I brought my Commodore 64C with an REU uh, to show off Petsky robots. And uh, Texelec was in the booth next to me, and he had, among other things, the Commander X16 on display. Uh, you can see it here running Super Mario Brothers. And uh, we also had another X16, which was designed by Wavicol, and um, which is a slightly small footprint and super cute design. Uh, and this one's playing Petsky Robots. Remember that Moonbase restoration I was working on, but the monitor board was having so much trouble? <laughs> well, I brought it back with me and tried to give it back to Adrian Black, but he didn't want it. I don't want that. That thing is cursed. In all seriousness, um, a guy by the name of Sark asked me to bring it with me uh, because he was pretty sure he could fix it. So I left it with him on Saturday and would check on it later. I always try to get video of some of the more interesting objects people bring me to sign, starting with this laser disc. Uh, here's a Newton message pad, only I'm signing it on the screen. Here's a C64 Mini. A Blueberry iMac keyboard. An Atari XEGS. A VHS cassette. And also an old IBM keyboard. Of course, I wasn't the only YouTuber there. Uh, here's Ken from Computer Clan, uh, Ben Heck, uh, Robin from 8-Bit Show & Tell, although you might not recognize his face, so instead, uh, let's look at his hands by keyboard. <laughs> Adrian Black was there, as well as uh, LGR with some of his wood grain stuff, and even Alec from Technology Connection stopped by for a bit. In fact, on Saturday, we all did a panel together, which is probably the most vintage tech YouTubers we've ever had in a single panel before. Uh, there was also quite a turnout as the room was packed and there was nowhere left to sit or stand. Uh, this panel is also available to watch and I'll put a link down in the description. Later that day, I went by to check on the moon base board and Sark was still working on it. Uh, he had determined that one of the voltage regulators was bad, uh, which is what he's holding here, and uh, so he's going to try to get a replacement. 
Once it calmed down that evening, I finally had a chance to walk around the place myself and see some of the things that people brought for display. Uh, the convention is loosely divided into different categories. Um, over here, as you can see, are lots of terminals and stuff from the 1970s. Uh, this guy here made his own custom Gigatron board. It's unfortunate the original designer has passed away, so uh, he can't see this. Over here we have some Amiga stuff, and they're showing off how the weather channel used to work back in the day on these older systems. And uh, more Unix stuff over here. Uh, this booth was, I guess what we'd call the phone booth, <laughs> pun intended. Um, ben Heck was over here typing on an ancient teletype. Here's some uh, Androbots and Atari stuff. Here's an old Odyssey playing Pong. Uh, this section was mostly Coco stuff. Um, there were lots of booths with uh, buy sell trade going on, uh, like this old Apple out here with the Twiggy drives, which is pretty rare and in great condition. And uh, three boxed 1581 disk drives, that's nerd heaven right there. <laughs> Dave's Retro Video Lab was here showing off some vintage camcorders. Of course, Commodore systems were well represented at the event. I even ran across a Max running basic. I don't know whose booth this was, but I saw a Mega Retron playing the Sega Genesis version of Pesky Robots, which uh, I thought was cool. But this was also pretty cool, an original black and white TV playing the Three Stooges called the Stoogeomatic. <laughs> there was also an entire series of British computers like the Sinclair and Memotech, and um, as you can see, the one that is connected to a CRT won't sync with my camera because it's running at 50 Hz. And don't worry, uh, Atari computers were also well represented at the event, including an original store display, which for some reason has Sun Spark stations in it. The next day, I went back to Sark's booth, and uh, he had the moon base board working, as you can see here. Um, so I asked him to tell me what he did. Uh, so I got it working. Uh, the problem was the voltage regulator circuit wasn't working. It was putting about 6 volts instead of 12. Uh, this transistor was bad. I've installed a new voltage regulator, a little bit better part, and wired it up. Now it works great. So uh, that is great news. I'll be able to get my moon base up and running when I get home. Uh, big thanks goes out to Sark. Later that day, even though it was pouring rain, uh, we decided to go visit the Galloping Ghost, which is supposed to be the world's biggest retro arcade or something like that. So what did I think of the place? Well, I have to admit, with 885 arcade games, they have just about everything, and the aisles just go on and on and on. Um, they even had some really old arcades that I haven't even heard of before, like these that uh, actually use monochrome CRTs and extremely primitive graphics. And while they aren't fun to play, uh, they were really interesting from a uh, historical aspect. And uh, I was wondering if they had a moon base here. I kept looking. They had moon shuttle and moon patrol. <laughs> and of course, um, the original space invaders, but no moon base. So I guess they don't have everything. But uh, one thing I was disappointed about is how many machines were broken. I mean, some were completely unplayable and others were perhaps partially working, but the screens were missing one of the primary colors or were really blurry or had other problems. And I understand these machines are old and they break down, but uh, I would have thought they'd pull them off the floor if they were needing repair. Also, it cost $25 a person to get in the door, which is double what any other arcade I've been to costs. Um, anyway, the, that wraps it up for VCF and the Galloping Ghost. So, back home now, I wanted to reinstall the repaired board back into my moon base and see it working. So here's where the board goes, and I guess this machine really is cursed because then this happened. Oh no. Did you just break the tube? I sure did. What did you do? I was going to put it in and I guess it was just too low and hit that metal. You can't see my face, but it looks something like this. This machine must really be cursed because I've put this tube back in this machine 50 times and never hit the neck like that. Only now, when it's about to be fixed, does it happen. Um, I really do wonder if Adrian was right when he said this machine is cursed. So now that means I have to find a new tube. Now for the moment, I guess I'll have to pull the tube out of this other moon base. So what I didn't mention before is that uh, these came in a pair and both machines were broken with different problems. And I had planned to restore one as an official video for my channel and then restore or sell the other one later. And uh, that's why if you watched Adrian's video, I had sent him both boards so he had points of comparison. 
So yeah, I guess for the moment I'll just take this one, and at least I can make one working machine. I'll have to find a replacement for the other machine later, and after a good cleaning, um, I installed it in the machine very carefully this time. And here goes. Uh, well, it's sort of working. Uh, let's try some adjustments. I think that's going to work. Of course, uh, I've seen this machine working before for about 10 minutes, so I actually tested it for about 30 minutes and played through a few games. It's actually hard to play with the tripod in the way, so I'm not doing a great job at the moment. And the other problem I have is glare. I just can't seem to get rid of it on the camera. And in person, it actually looks really good, and with the lights off, you can barely see those color filters, and it really could just about fool you into thinking that this was a color screen, even though it isn't. Anyway, I'm, I'm happy to have this one working, while also sad that uh, repairing the other one is going to be even more difficult without a tube. By the way, one last thing I noticed when looking at the old tube is the phosphor missing from the center of the screen. I guess the air rushing in just blew it away. I, I would have thought that it would be stuck on the inside of the screen a bit more securely, but I guess not. Anyway, uh, that wraps it up for VCF, so uh, what's coming up next? Well, I'll be taking a deep dive into the state of the Commander X-16 project. I am also doing some solar upgrades, I can't wait to show you those. I'm also planning an episode on the ice pick cartridge for the C-64. So stick around for those episodes, and um, as always, thanks for watching.